All right. So <clears throat> welcome, everybody, uh, into the wormhole. Uh, my name is uh, Kizmyanthia. Uh, I've been doing this for a long time. Uh, kind of background. This is just, you know, slides I got to put in here. Nobody really cares. So why are we actually here? So uh, the into the into the wormhole talk uh, is all about Metasploit and how we can actually leverage it for uh, web hacking. And I know probably 99% of the people I talk to are like, "You're full of shit. Metasploit's only for network side of the house." And uh, or a lot of times you're like, oh, "I haven't used Metasploit since uh, like it was written in Python." Um, so. This talk will kind of give you an introduction about uh, my, uh, what Metasploit is. We'll go through and uh, start talking about kind of what makes it all up and then how to actually apply this to, uh, to our web testing and actually uh, like get shell on browsers and all kinds of cool shit like that. So uh, we'll also cover some of the auxiliaries, how this actually not only uh, can you use Metasploit to do the actual exploitation stuff, but how you can actually bolster some of the, uh, um, the steps within the methodology and how it actually will help you throughout the process. And then we'll look at uh, some of the actual um, third-party apps and the, the modules that uh, leverage Metasploit to make them more powerful. So uh, first and foremost, it's kind of like the, the old uh, and where Metasploit really came from. So Metasploit was developed by HD Moore. Uh, most of you guys, if you know Metasploit, you know that. Uh, it's been around since 2003. So Metasploit is one of the older tools that uh, really have been used throughout the ages. Uh, Metasploit then <coughs> uh, got picked up and uh, was actually bought by Rapid7. Uh, one of the nice things, though, is that they didn't kill it by turning it into just a commercial tool. You can buy a pro license but they still left the actual framework out there for everybody to use. So now you get the research and development of corporate money, and you get the research and development of the open source community stuff, all built in one place, and then allowing you to actually dynamically create that content. So by putting all that together, Metasploit really kind of is the, uh, the, the um, Swiss army knife of hacking for whether it's utilizing that tool to do the exploitation, generating your shell code, things like that, or just using it and leveraging the power of it to cut down on the time of some of the stuff that you're able to do. So a couple of the versions of Metasploit out there, obviously you have your framework stuff. This is your command line, this is your built-in to Kali, backtrack, whatever version of uh, the various security distros that you're using. And then they also have the community tool. It's got a really pretty fuzzy GUI uh, that uh, if you really necessitate fun web pages to do all this stuff, you can use that too. And then they've got two actual paid versions. Um, and I will tell you right now that for $3,000, if you want to go and spend 30 grand on Metasploit Pro, go for it. I wish I had extra money to spend like that, but everything you can do in Pro, you can do in the framework. So. You can go through and whether it's the uh, the exploits or whatever. The only thing you're buying for 30k is an easy button. If you really want an easy button, I can sell you one of those. I'll, I'll even give you a deal. I'll only charge you 28k. So, uh, what is Metasploit? And kind of, you know, what what really makes up Metasploit and why is Metasploit as powerful as it is? Well, first, Metasploit has a lot of different types of exploits in it. You have your direct exploits, which we're all really familiar with. This is your old school stuff. Uh, this is the, the every training hacker class you've ever sit in MS 08067 because it works fantastically and anybody that's never gotten shell on a machine, you can get shell on a machine and it's just magic and you get a big old smile and some stars in your eyes and oh my god, this actually works! And then uh, you also have things like passive exploits. These are going to be browser-based exploits. These require user interaction. So just like you'd have something like reflective cross-site scripting somewhere, things like that, there's some exploits that you can actually use that for social engineering and leveraging the power of Metasploit 4. So this is what the pretty graphic, unfortunately, this screen kind of sucks, but. Uh, so Metasploit, uh, you can launch this. It's built into most of the uh, security distros out there. MSF console, 
and you, you, get, pop, you get popped right into the, uh, the actual command line. Super easy, super, you know, step one is to actually get it to run, right? Well, the nice thing about nowadays is you don't have to compile your headers and you don't have to compile all this. You, you literally type it into the uh, terminal and you actually get Metasploit to start up. Metasploit, uh, right from the command line, you can get your help just like any other tool out there. And you can run a lot of things all outside of actually loading that whole framework. So if you've got to do things real quick, real fast, and you don't want to have all of the bloat that goes into some of the back end stuff, you can do all that just by running it in a, in a string right off the, uh, the initial load. So direct exploits. Uh, if you could actually see this better. Uh, is there any way we can dim like lights up here? No, nobody's in here actually listening. Is there? <laughs> I don't know, push buttons, fuck it. It's a hacker conference. Something's happening. Ooh. No, I, I just get spotlights. I think that might be worse. The other button. <laughs> there we go. Okay. It still looks like shit. All right. So uh, direct exploits are, are going to be like, like I said before, like your MSO8 stuff, things that are going to leverage vulnerabilities in services, leverage vulnerabilities in uh, shares, things that you're going to use Metasploit to actually go out and touch. Right, so here we've got uh, like our PS exec module. If you're not familiar with this, pass the hash, you, you know, in the Windows world, it's really nice because you don't have to actually crack uh, local password files and things like that. Look it up later. Uh, passive exploits. These are things like your browser exploits, things like the Aurora exploit, which we'll cover later. Um, you can use these for uh, generating shell, uh, Java exploits and things like that. These are all, these are kind of the bread and butter of what makes up Metasploit. So one of them here, this, uh, this is a uh, Internet Explorer exploit. Um, it leverages uh, a uh, buffer overflow in, in the way that Internet Explorer handles images. So this is a, it's an older exploit, but this is just an example of one. So how does this help me, right? You know, uh, it, it sounds cool. Does this stuff really work? Is this actually play any, any sort of part, or am I, I just up here because I like to hear myself talk? Well, that is true, but you know, I'm actually here to uh, you know, talk about some of the other cool stuff. Not you know, and I want to see myself on YouTube, so. All right, so kind of the, you know, the framework, the skeleton of uh, what makes up Metasploit is a couple of different things. Obviously, first off, you have your exploit. It's the, it's the framework, it's in the name, it's obviously part of the utility. So Metas you, the exploit itself is built in, but the exploit that you build, that piece of code that you're gonna use to exploit the vulnerability has a lot of other pieces that are built into it. So, uh, we can skip that, I just kinda covered that. Uh, the next one is actually the payload. So first you've got your exploit, you've got whatever is, is actually gonna break that vulnerability, right? This is that buffer overflow. This is that um, remote connection that is leveraging a string or the way that a system connects. The next part is actually the payload. This is how we get connection. This is where all of the, the magic happens. This is your defining whether you're gonna do a shell or an interpreter, whether you're gonna have it connect back to us via a reverse connection. This is where you define all of those pieces. Next part is actually that shell code. Okay, so you've got your exploit, you've got the way that you wanted to do it, and then you've got the actual code that's generated. This is, this is the actual piece that's uploaded onto and through uh, that vulnerability. You've also got some module stuff, okay, and these are either things that you custom generate, these are add-ons that are others in, in the community uh, create, these are the the add-ons. These are the pieces that leverage Metasploit, but aren't necessarily directly from like the the re, the uh, um, the repo or the uh, uh, the development string itself. And then you have the listeners, right? If we're going to call out and we're going to tell it to do something, we got to have some way to talk to it. 
So Metasploit has a way of not only going out there doing the exploitation, not just generating that shell code, but it has that other piece where it'll sit there and listen or do a, a connection directly within Bind to actually lock in and allow you to interact in two-way communication with, uh, with whatever system you're exploiting. So exploit, or the auxiliary modules specifically have a number of different pieces that they can use and that you can use to bolster your methodology, all right? And I know that, you know, methodology at a hacker talk is kind of like, I don't do anything like that. I, I just fly by the seat of my pants. I'm fucking cool. Um, you know, well, if you actually break it down and actually apply that to the way that you're going to go through, it makes life easier. It really does. So uh, some of the auxiliary modules allow you to not only do your information gathering stuff, but you can actually do like your brute forcing. You can do generate custom ones, and we'll kind of cover that stuff later. But it allows you to really have that dynamic control over Metasploit itself. And then you have some of the plugins and third-party stuff. This, these are more dynamic, more robust pieces that leverage Metasploit as a whole. So how many people obviously here have heard of SET, Social Engineer Toolkit? Awesome. So it, it, what it, the Social Engineer's Toolkit does is it allows you to do all kinds of cool little social engineering pieces, email, phishing, all kinds of things. But you can leverage the power of Metasploit within that. So you have the ability to use things like the Meterpreter um, package to actually have real good rat control of, of whatever system, Windows systems, uh, that you're exploiting out there. And some of the utilities. And as I had my class yesterday, I, I didn't even realize it, no, but uh, it's a sad, sad day as of Monday. So MSF payload and MSF encode are officially being phased out. Um, they, they've got some new hotness MSF Venom that they're bringing in, which is like the Lamborghini. We do it all. Uh, but I, I've been writing stuff in Metasploit for so long that uh, like everything that I do automatically goes to MSF payload and encode. But these are the utilities that are built in to Metasploit that you can actually leverage directly from the terminal to generate your custom shell code. So you don't actually have to use the stuff that signatures are already generated for, that companies know exist and protect against. You can create all this stuff right on the fly whenever you need it. How many people here knew that Metasploit actually was able to do web application scanning? I got a couple hands. I'm impressed. That's like the most hands I've ever seen in this talk. Uh, WMAP is actually a web app scanner that's built into Metasploit. It allows you to actually take a look at the application, and it'll do a scan of any associated exploits to see whether it's vulnerable or not. Again, just the power of Metasploit that really, unless you drill down into it, a lot of people don't even know exist. And then obviously, like I said before, social engineers too, okay? Awesome utility, I use this thing all the time. So, next part is actually how uh, this all integrates and why it's important to actually have the methodology and why Metasploit actually fits into our met methodology. So, there's lots of different methodologies out there. There's good reasons for them and there's bad reasons for them, but really, Metasploit fits into every single little piece of our methodologies, whether it's information gathering, whether it's the exploitation phase, there's even uh, the ability to use the database for logging and reporting. It, they're not awesome reports unless you pay 30K for the, for the pro version, but um, you, you get the ability to keep track of everything you're doing. You get to go th use it and leverage it in each piece of your methodology. So the first part, obviously, is information gathering. What, you know, the importance, why do we do this? Well, obviously, if we don't know what we're touching or we don't have that information about what is actually out there, we're just going to be kicking cans and we're going to be shooting shotguns at whatever we're, we're looking at, and we're not going to get real far or it's going to take us forever to do so. You can actually leverage Metasploit and Nmap to, to store all that information. And not only just store the information, but you can actually query Metasploit against that stored information to find specific exploits that are, are associated with, whether it's a service, a, a type of system, things like that. And it, uh, once again, it cuts down the amount of time that we have to spend on this stuff. 
So the first part about that, obviously, like I said, is we need to create the DB. Now, Kelly has moved over to a corporate, awesome, fed, sweet distro where we turn everything off and we're not, you know, we're, we want to be cool and we want to be a real uh, Linux version. So we shut everything off first. So the first thing that you have to do is you have to make sure you actually turn the database back on. Uh, so when you do that, you just turn your Postgres service to start and you can create your user. Now, you can go through the, uh, the nice little walkthrough. All these slides are uh, online later too, so you can download this stuff and fuck around with it later. Um, you create your user, make sure that you have your connection set up, and then you'll get you know, the happy console uh, that'll pop up. Make sure that after, right before you're gonna actually start executing this stuff, if you wanna use this for the logging, for the reporting, for, this, for the uh, uh, recording, you just have to make sure that Metasploit framework itself is actually connected to the DB. Now when Metasploit, or Rapid7, moved Metasploit over to Pro, they foobarred the way the tables are for framework, so you actually have to generate your uh, tables and connect it first, and yeah, so they made it kind of a pain in the ass for us old schoolers, but it, it, it actually works pretty easy. You got your string real, right there, and it'll recreate your tables for you. So it, it's not a whole huge pain in the ass, but if you don't know that off the bat, Metasploit will start throwing you errors, and you're gonna be like, fuck this, that guy lied. So uh, Metasploit and uh, NMAP really kind of have been built together um, as like a cohesive unit. And there's very easy internal Metasploit con uh, switches and commands that allow you to directly input that information right into the da database. So once you have MSF console loaded, you can start using the, the uh, db underscore nmap, and it'll actually store all that stuff for you. You can query it right from within Metasploit, and it'll store that for um, reference to exploits and such later. Metasploit also has lots of auxiliary scanners and extra pieces and things hidden in, in the repositories. So you can do things like SMB scanning, you can do FTP scanning, you can look for all kinds of different specific services, and there's auxiliary modu modules that are directly uh, created within the Metasploit framework, and it'll store all that information directly in the database as you run them. So it, it really does cut down the amount of time from information gathering to the exploitation phase. So uh, here's just a real quick screen from, uh, this would be our web dev uh, scanner. So in the case of websites out there, you can actually use a, an auxiliary module within uh, Metasploit to uh, specifically go and look, look for the web dev folder. Why, why would anybody want to have access to or find a web dev folder on an HTTP server? I'm actually asking a question. Right, it's a vulnerable spot where you might be able to upload code, might be able to put some, some kind of uh, page, PHP, shell, uh, maybe run something cool on there. It's a spot where you actually have a vector to uh, get stuff up there. So just like before, uh, any other uh, module, the auxiliary scanner actually has the ability to define what you're, uh, what you're gonna test, what, whether it's a range, whether it's a single server, the whole internet, however you wanna use it, the, the auxiliary modules are built in so that you can run it real easy right from the spot. So here, once you have your setup, you type exploit, hit enter, and we can see that on this one particularly, it's an older, older IIS box. We've got a web dev folder, and maybe we can do something cool with it. So, uh, as, and then this would be the next piece of it. So you have your scanner and your auxiliary. The auxiliary will find that folder, and then we've got our direct exploit right here, where uh, we actually are pushing a Metasploit module up within the uh, specific uh, web dev folder. This in particular would be an ASP file, and then try to get that to run up there. So this one will actually generate a Metasploit uh, with a random character .asp file. And then once you get that up there, if you can browse to that, it'll execute it on the server. And if everything works right, we've got real nice connection right at the, uh, on that remote machine. So you can see where we put that up on our web dev folder, we've got our ASP code, and then once it's run, we've got our listener waiting for that connection. 
This is just one of those instances, kind of what you can do once you have that connection. You can see where we're able to start pulling the remote machine's uh, IP information and such. So the next part, once we have an idea of what's up there, once we have an idea of what we're looking at, it's really to get that more detailed information, right? And if we have specifically uh, information about a range or a number of different machines, we want to use some vulnerability scanners or some kind of function to look for known exploits. That stuff that's low-hanging fruit. Cuts down our time again. So Nmap has the NSC, the Nmap scanning engine built in. Metasploit will let you import from Nessus. Metasploit will let you import from Nexpos. It'll let you do a lot of different imports just directly from the, uh, uh, the vulnerability scanners themselves. Pro, obviously it has a little bit more robustness, but again, you can do just about all of that in the framework itself. So WMAP, all right. I, I saw that a couple of you have actually heard of this. Um, some, some may not even be aware that this is, uh, even uh, was close to existing. So WMAP was developed by the same guys that did SQL Map, or same group that did SQL Map. Um, and it looks specifically for version information, service information, OS information, and then it'll iterate through the exploits that would be associated with that. It uses the database and the storage of the information that we gained to actually uh, figure out which ones are specific to uh, that, that host. To get this running, once you have your database connected, because you have to have that in place, uh, you simply use the load command w, wmap and it'll kick you right into the, uh, the module itself. Super, super easy, just like the rest of Metasploit. Once you're in it, it's got a detailed help file. There's not a whole lot of commands, which means that there's not a whole lot you can get wrong. So it makes it pretty easy. Once you have your information, your specific URL, <coughs> your IP address, uh, you can you set your st string, excuse me, set your string, hit enter, and it'll go through and it'll start looking. Once it has uh, iter or actually made that connection that that site is available, it'll give you the detail for what port, the type of protocol it's using, and it stores that information. So the next step is that we actually take the vhost, which will be populated down here after we uh, do our initial scan, and the, uh, the URL that we want it to actually look at, and we populate that into the information, or in, into the uh, command line. So you can see where we have that set right here. We define that as our target. We can see with the L command, we can see exactly what we're, lo uh, what we're looking at, make sure we have it formatted properly, and then we can actually run that with the wmap underscore run. And this will actually allow us to also define if we have specific vulnerabilities or specific information that we're looking for and we don't want it to iterate through all of the various versions to what we want to specifically define. So once it goes through, it'll actually start testing the web server. It'll start looking at uh, what, what are those services based on the auxiliary information. It'll then iterate through and move over to doing the actual scan. And uh, once you have the, uh, that information, you can see exactly which modules and which exploits it'll iterate through. I thought I had a slide that was farther down. Yeah, there we go. So, and then once it, and once it actually finishes, you can query for what vulnerabilities were found. And when you actually look at the vulnerabilities that it's, been de that it's detected, it'll give you the specific details. So it'll tell you what folder it's in, It'll tell you whether you know, it got the detailed information it was expecting, if there was an error. But this is all built in. This is all free. This, is all, uh, this isn't something that you have to go out and spend you know, $1,000, $10,000, $50,000 on some commercial scanner. And you have a higher uh, likelihood of actual exploitation with Metasploit, getting some, something to, uh, to work where you're actually on that box with, uh, with Metasploit than you do with um, probably nine-tenths of the uh, commercial tools out there. So why, why auxiliaries? Why are these cool? Why is, this, why is this hip? Why is this fun? Well, because not only are these built in, but Metasploit's made so that you guys can go out and create and leverage the power of Metasploit for what you need. So 
there's some standards. There's uh, specific ways and specific uh, dependencies that you have to call within your code. But because it's written in Ruby, it's fairly easy to pick up. It's fairly simple to understand. And if you can do any sort of other um, scripting, Python, Perl, Ruby, all those, they all kind of function the same way. So we set our definitions, we set our specifics, we detail the exploit and all the information in our, in our code. And we can do things like custom scanners. So say we have an application that we're going to do an internal test on, uses a different kind of port than standard, you know, the standard NMAP 1000. If you have a specific uh, developed uh, protocol or something that that app is using, you can uh, test those types of things by building your own custom uh, auxiliaries. So just as, uh, you know, building uh, a, a Lego octopus in this case, uh, you, once you start putting those pieces together, uh, you're able to build it pretty quickly. So first thing, obviously, quick text editor. And you want to make sure that you have your header information. The MSF core, is there, that's the bread and butter of what makes that, that auxiliary work. The, and then you want to define specifically what uh, type of module you're building. So the MSF auxiliary is, will start loading some of the information. It'll call the specific drivers that are needed, things like that, that run in the back end. And Metasploit as a framework makes that possible without you having to rewrite all that stuff. So the next part is the way that it starts. All Metasploit modules have their name, they have what version it is, they have the, you know, the description of kind of what it, this thing does, and then the auth author all built into that. That's, the, that's that main piece that when you actually load a, uh, a module, whether it's an exploit or an auxiliary, it's the first thing that people see. Next part is the register options. This is where all of the details specifically for uh, what we're going to go after, whether this is a uh, range of IPs, whether this is a specific service, this is where we define that information. And then once we get the mix in, which is the, the code that uh, has already been created, again, Metasploit is made for speed. Uh, once we get that mix in defined and we have that set, we can specifically call the, whether it's the socket information, whether, whether it's the port information, it's already been uh, developed so that we don't have to rewrite, again, re we don't have to remake the wheel to make these connections. And then you simply save it, put it in the auxiliary, and in this case, this is a quick scanner, um, put it in the auxiliaries folder, and you can see where there's all kinds of uh, auxiliary uh, auxiliary modules here. If you actually browse to the Metasploit location and see and uh, see what's in there, all of those modules you can call dynamically from from the uh, command line. So after all of that, it's a quick understand this is this is the extent of the code. This is what makes a quick uh, scanner looking specifically for so we've got our our port right here. We're looking for 31337. It's going to uh, make that connection validate it whether we can touch it or not. And that's, that's the extent of building one of these models or modules. It doesn't take very long and it can cut down the amount of time that we need or we sp spend looking for specific things. Call it just like any other module in there and once you're set up. So you can see where our default information is already populated. We've got our R port. Difference between our host and our hosts when you're developing one of these modules is the ability to put in a range. So when you're developing this, if you utilize our host without the plural, it's going to only let you put in one single target. If you uh, utilize the our host method, it'll allow you to find a range. Now the thing that's cool about that is the modules that are already exist that are locked into, say, a single uh, target, you can modify that. So like uh, the sweet PS exec module that's made to only touch one, unless you pay for the pro, which you can do it against the range, guess what you can do? You can go on and modify the original uh, module, set it to your, uh, our host class, and you can do that across multiple pieces. So there you, are. you run it just like anything else. Uh, you make sure that uh, in that case, we, we made a connection, we did a hello, and we got the banner back from, from there. 
it really cuts down that amount of time that uh, you're going to spend not only looking for specifics or looking for uh, something in particular, but when you need that one little thing, that, w that one little scanner, that one little uh, connection, all, a lot of that has already been developed for you. So taking this and putting this into uh, web applications, how many times have you seen a, you know, a section in a web app where you can upload a new avatar, you can post pictures, you might be able to put up uh, a, uh, um, some, some kind of cat picture, some kind of gift, things like that, up on a website. Well, in a lot of cases, you know, you would, you would, normal users would just put that cat picture up, post it to their site, and call it a day. We want to leverage that to actually start breaking shit. So uh, the MSF payload again, and then MSF encode, allow us to generate our own custom payloads, package it, and then encode it so that we can even bypass AV. So things like uh, MSF payload and then the new one, MS MSF Venom, will actually allow us to generate this stuff and actually see and edit our shell code to make it either, you know, not signature or not kick off signatures or specify a particular way of doing our connection. So in this case, Metasploit had, and well, when I did this, there was 251 different types of payloads that you could use. This is different types of systems. When we did the class yesterday, it was up to 360-some payloads. That's 360-some different types of connections that we can, we can get. This is everything in this case. You can see where it's AIX. This will be Linux, this can be Android, this can be all kinds of different systems out there. And then different ways to do it, whether it's a reverse connection, a bind connection, a 64-bit uh, connection. It, there's all kinds of different things in there. So this, uh, this string, like I said, as of, uh, as of Monday, uh, if, if you update, uh, MSF payload and MSF encode uh, will actually uh, be moving away. So there, it's, it's still a pertinent string, but there's a, small, a shorter version of it with, uh, with the new hotness venom. Once you actually go through and you, put, and you generate your payload, we have to define our specific, our, our, uh, what payload we want to use. In this case, because we're using the reverse payload, we have to define where it's going to call back to us. Once we have the information specific to where our attack box sits, where the type of connection, we can then use encode to put that out to a specific file. So we're going to use our raw output, put it into an ASP file, and in this case, by default, it's going to uh, use the Shikata uh, encoder to obfuscate that code. Once we've got that set up, we start our listener. Um, it, uh, the multi-handler is just a generic uh, listener that Metasploit builds in, so that if anything dials back on that specific port, uh, we're ready to upload some, uh, uh, some shell code. So when we use reverse uh, payloads, it actually is a staged exploit. So only part of the shell code exists in the initial upload. The secondary piece of that is pushed up once it makes the connection. Once we have that all set up, just like any other module, exploit means run. We have that sitting and waiting. So what we can do is now we've got our ASP uh, generated code, our, our little module. We have our listener going. We get that. We push that up there. Now, obviously, this is a test machine. Well, hopefully, this is a test machine if we're able to just push straight ASP code up. Uh, and we, we can see where the, our specific pay, package is sitting. Once we uh, click on that within the browser, it activates that on the back end. We can see where that directly connects to our listener. It sends that secondary piece of uh, the exploit, and we've got a connection on that remote machine. So obviously, there's, there's other things that we can do as well, right? So we want to actually build something that we don't need to upload. We want to have everybody that visits our sweet attack site um, will leverage some kind of uh, some kind of an exploit. Well, Metasploit also has client side ex attacks. So these are browser based attacks. These are uh, whether it's Internet Explorer, whether it's Firefox, whether it's Chrome. These are exploits that have something broken inside the way the browser handles um, the content, 
And we, if we can get everyone in the world to click on it, uh, we, we can own the world. So uh, some of the uh, uh, browser-based exploits use a process called heap spraying. Uh, how many people are familiar with? Okay, awesome. So it's basically a technique where you're uh, pushing the, uh, the boundaries of the heap memory to overflow that and then allow you to execute uh, some code within that, within that overflow space. Um, by do what we do is we leverage NOPs, which uh, in, the, in I86 I assembly, it would be your 90 or x slash 90. Uh, and then we have a string of those that go into succession so that it makes it easier for us. So when we're actually looking and generating our shell code, we ha we've create what's called our knob slide. So you can see that string of 90s uh, within our code here. Well, that makes it real easy for us to find when we're actually doing uh, the uh, development for our exploit. So within our debugger, we're, we're able to actually see how that exists. So the first thing we do is we generate our payload, right? We want, we want our shell code. We need we need that code to use. We need that extra, that extra piece, that, that breaking piece. And when you use Metasploit to do it, this is, kind of, this is essentially what you'll get the output. This is right here. This is the shell code. This is what we want the uh, software, we want the break, we want the actual vulnerability to allow to be run uh, because this is what's going to initiate our connection. So if we go ahead and take our... Uh, our NOP slide here, and we're going to obviously remove some of the characters so that we can get it all, uh, all in one uh, numerical piece, if you will. So we're going to take this, remove all our X's and our slashes, copy and paste our uh, NOP slide right before it, and then we're going to load our debugger. In this case, we're using Internet Explorer. So we're going to load Internet Explorer into Immunity or IDA or whichever, uh, you, whichever debugger that you're using, hex rays. Uh, you're going to paste that specific uh, code, so the combination of your shell code and your NOP slide, and do a binary paste inside of Internet Explorer. And when we run, we're looking for spe specifically for that break. So if, it, if everything works perfectly, once, uh, in this case, Internet Explorer gets to our import, if that overflow works, it'll run the shell code, we'll get our connection locally, and magic, we are on the machine. Now, does this shit actually work, or is this just like movie magic where it, it just looks cool? How many people are familiar with the Aurora attack? Good couple of hands. A good number of uh, big uh, internet companies uh, fell victim to the Aurora vulnerability. What this does is this actually is the, in the wild the same exact heap overflow that we just created. And there's a module for it. So you don't have to recreate it. You can, do, you can just call this wi right within Metasploit. So once we leverage the uh, Metasploit module, we load the, uh, the Aurora vulnerability, or the Aurora module specifically. We define our payload. Obviously, in this case, we want all of those machines that hit this to call back to us. So we're going to use a reverse connection. We define our, our local host, our listening host, and our listening port, and we put it out on the internet. Right? So Aurora has long since been patched, but uh, if it works right, what you do is, uh, is one of those browsers out there loads our page. We can load this into an iframe. We can we can be, do something cool with it. We can have www.goooogle um, or some other fun uh, domain name that we put this on. If we can get those browsers to hit it, it'll sit there and spin. And the browser looks like it stalls. If you have some cool you know dancing cat or a dancing uh, banana banana or something, it, they'll sit. And the user can sit there and watch that while this runs in the background. Once that runs, we can see where the Aurora memory corruption uh, vulnerability gets exploited. It pushes our shell code up, and once again, we have a connection. This very vulnerability hit a good number of people back when, when it first came out. So looking at this, what, 
what kind of stuff can we actually do? Okay, it's awesome. We've got, we've got connection. We've got uh, some sort of exploit that we've run. We feel awesome. But what can we actually do with this? Well, in a lot of cases, once you have that connection, Meterpreter, if you are on a Windows box, is an awesome remote access tool. It is one of the most robust remote access tools that I know of, and you can do lots of cool things. So you can actually migrate in the f and generate new um, instances of an application and leverage the, uh, the service running. In this case, you can see where that fails, but Meterpreter gives us another option. Once we have that connection, we can actually see all of the running processes. From here, we can use the migrate command within Meterpreter to specifically define one of those processes to hook into. Once we hook into that, we're, we're local on that machine. Now, if the user clicks close on the browser, you don't have to worry about losing your session. Once we can migrate over to there, obviously the next thing we want to do is elevate our privilege. Well, they make it super easy because now we got get system. And once, you're, once you run the get system command, you can uh, elevate your permissions to system level and we can start doing other cool shit. So just, just like you can do uh, exploits within the browser, you can leverage things like uh, cross-site scripting to also get access to, uh, to the remote users. Cross-site scripting framework um, is a, an add-in. It's not built into uh, Metasploit, and you actually have to go onto Google Code and pull it down and import it into the repository, or in, into the application. Once you do that, it makes it real easy. You can call it just like you called the uh, uh, WMAP from within. And you can load your specific details for your cross-site scripting plugin. Once you have your cross-site scripting plugin uh, loaded up, you're able to actually run Metasploit code or Metasploit shells within the, the cross-site scripting vulnerability to, allow, again, allow you to get access to, you know, on the remote side uh, for, uh, to those, uh, those hosts. So I'm, I'm kind of speeding through here, running out of time. Uh, so uh, just like before, we get it set up, we run exploit, and we have this sitting on our server. Again, if you have a phishing attack, if you have some kind of a social engineering attack, if you have a uh, website out there that you're using, anytime that you're able to exploit a cross-site scripting vulnerability within a page, you can leverage the cross-site scripting framework to push that uh, remote access code, that shell code, up to that remote user. So if we take a look, we've got our page right there. We've got our script text. We've got our local, ho the, uh, the remote host information and then we can validate that we're actually connected. So right there you can see where the exploit ran with an Internet Explorer. We've got our remote information, and then we're actually going to jump into the box. There's our full details. This is leveraging the, the remote connection via cross-site scripting. So we can go further. We jump into our exploit. It'll automate the, the process. You can see where we're doing uh, the Java applet. Once that Java applet's been loaded within that connection, it, uh, it'll actually pop that up right on the, on the user's machine. So you have a direct connection with that browser via the, fr the cross-site scripting framework. If you can get that, in this case, if you can get that user to, uh, um, to click OK, it'll, it'll upload that, on that shell, and now we can get an interpreter connection to that. Very similar to the way that we use uh, cross-site scripting, you can also leverage SQL maps. So say you have SQL injection on, uh, on a host, you can leverage SQL map to imp inject that, uh, that payload within the, uh, the vulnerability. So if you, not only are you able to you know, remove information and, and uh, get information from a host through a SQL injection, but now you're able to push code up there and you're able to pu push remote, co remote access code. So here we have uh, an instance where uh, we have a SQL injection vulnerability. It's within a post, because we've got our data string. And uh, do we have cookie on? No cookie on there, so we don't have to be authenticated. Once SQL map goes through, SQL map will go th define the a specific uh, 
host. It'll define whether we actually have um, SQL injection. It'll do some other tests, and it'll run through and give us the information specific to that host. Once we have that, we can use the command dash dash os dash pwn within that string, and SQL map will actually call Metasploit directly from, the, from within it. So we define that we, we want to use the Metasploit uh, build-in. Once we have that piece set up, we define how we want it to connect back to us. And if uh, we can use our default, or you can define. So if you have a NAT statement that you have, or an, uh, a NATed IP that you need to use, you can define that here. And then our, your type of connection. So hit yes. And it'll iterate through. It'll load Metasploit directly for you. Define all those parameters that we talked about earlier and upload that payload. So now you can use an, that's, that same vulnerability where we were just removing information to actually get remote connection on that host. So once you're on, once you're on the host, you can, you know, just like anything else, you've got full access to, uh, to the, to the uh, details there. Once on that, Metasploit also gives you the ability to do what's called pivoting. And that's just like what it sounds. Once you have access to a machine on the back end, you can utilize that back end shell connection. Uh, if Meterpreter, again, if you can get that, and it's kind of the most robust version of it. But it'll allow us to send all of our scanner stuff um, and all of our uh, information gathering uh, utilities through that exploited machine back into the network and then get all the information back out. Now, Metasploit Pro, again, they, all, they have a layer two VPN pivot uh, that allows you to do some other stuff, but the proxy pivoting is super stupid easy to get set up. So once we actually have our connection to that backend machine, we can use the route statement to see what other IP spaces that that machine can touch. Now, in this case, we know, obviously, 192.168 is probably our local LAN, LAN, but we also have a 10 dot space. So that might be of interest. What we can do there is we can specifically look and add that route to our local routing uh, table. Once we have that loaded into our route table, we can then start passing uh, exploits and utilizing the built-in scanners to start doing exploitation or information gathering on other machines inside that network. Here we're going to do a quick scan and looking for specifically Windows machines within the 10 space that we had found. You can see where we found two or found one of them. Now, once we have that information, uh, here we're using our MSO80067 vulnerability, and we're going to try to get access to that secondary machine through our initial exploitation, uh, our initial pivot point. Once we actually run this, just like any other module, if everything has been successful, we can get access to that secondary machine. So this is a 10-dot machine. After we've already done either a browser exploit or uh, a uh, payload exploit that we're touching now. Now we have access to that next step. Once we're on there, we could also do something like uh, utilizing the interpreter function of uh, hash dump to grab all of the local SAM hashes. Well, the nice thing about that is that we also have the PS exec module built into uh, Metasploit. And when you're making a, that SMB connection, Microsoft's not dumb enough to send that in clear text, are they? No, right? What do they send? Anybody? They send the hash, right? So if we nicely provide the, our username and that hash that we just dumped without cracking it and send that over in the uh, expected format, guess what we're going to be able to do? We're going to be able to connect to all those other machines without having to do any cracking. <laughs> all right, so real quick, there you go. Send that over, and then you can actually do connections there. I have three, like three more slides. And then I will shut the fuck up. Uh, so once we get that inside, the next thing that we want to do, obviously it's all cool, it's all well to be able to get uh, local administrator access, but where's, where's the juicy stuff? Where's the stuff we really want to touch? That's on the domain, right? Well, we have, some, we have an answer for that too. Meterpreter has a module called Incognito. If you haven't used Incognito, heard of Incognito, it is awesome. It's, it's a whole lot of fun. 
those machines that we've touched, if they've got people logged onto them, like most machines and uh, most networks do, if they're connected to the domain, we can specifically see those sessions in the domain tokens. In particular, here you can see we have an administrator that's logged on. Well, if we have that administrator that's logged on and we use incognito, we can impersonate that token and we can use Metasploit to actually jump into that session, execute all of our commands as that user, and do some other cool things. So here if we use our execute, our command.exe, we can jump right into the, sh into the uh, local uh, terminal on that machine and we can do some other fu fun things. We can start actually querying the domain controller as that admin to see what um, users are in the net groups, issue net commands. And if we can issue net commands, well, we can use net commands. So now we could actually issue a net user add, add that user to the uh, domain as that domain administrator. So if you have logging or if you have things that are in place, you're not going to have um, have some outside connection or some non-elevated user creating that. You're actually going to have that created by the uh, system and made administrator. I know. So Metasploit is the power. The whole thing is, is you can do custom everything. And if you can do custom everything, you can do a lot of stuff as far as the uh, um, Metasploit and, and web apps. So there's all the links. Uh, the slide deck on the bottom there, uh, you guys can download and play with all this stuff. Uh, I promise most of this shit actually works, and I'm not just up here bullshit. So uh, there you go. That's, that's my talk, and uh, I'm shutting the fuck up.